spiritual psychology, subconscious and supraconscious. Today and the day after tomorrow, I propose to discuss a few of the more important facts relating to consciousness and to karmic connections. If you cast only a superficial glance at what exists in your soul from waking up in the morning to falling asleep at night, ideas, moods, impulses of will, adding, of course, all the impressions that approach the soul from the outside, then you have everything that may be called the contents of ordinary consciousness. It must be clear to us that all these details of our conscious activity are dependent under ordinary conditions on the instruments of the physical body. The immediate irrefutable proof of this is that we must wake up in order to live within these facts of the ordinary consciousness. For us, this means that we must descend into the physical body with what is outside the body during sleep. And the physical body must be at our disposal with its instruments if the activities of the ordinary consciousness are to take their course. <clears throat> now the following question arises. In what way do we as human beings, as soul and spiritual beings, make use of our physical instruments, our sense organs and nervous system, to live in our everyday consciousness? In the materialistic world out there, we find the belief that our physical instruments in fact produce what goes on in our consciousness. I have frequently pointed out that this is not the case. It is not true that we should think of our sense organs or the brain as producing the events in our consciousness in the same way a candle brings forth a flame. The relationship <coughs> between what we call consciousness and the bodily instruments is completely different. We can compare it with the relationship between a person looking into a mirror and the mirror. When we are sleeping, we live in our consciousness in the same way as if, let us say, we were walking straight ahead in a room. If we walk straight ahead in a room, we do not see ourselves, how our nose or forehead looks, and so on and so forth. Only when someone comes toward us with a mirror do we behold ourselves. Then we are faced with what has existed all along, but now it also exists for us. It is the same with the contents of our ordinary consciousness. They exist continually within us, and as such they have nothing whatsoever to do with the physical body, as little as we ourselves have to do with the mirror mentioned above. The materialistic theory concerning this is simply nonsense. It is not even a possible hypothesis. For what the materialists claim can only be compared with people saying that because they can see themselves in the mirror, the mirror has created them. If you want to delude yourself that the mirror creates you because you see yourself only when it is held up to you, then you can also believe that parts of the brain or of the sense organs produce the contents of your soul life. Both statements are equally, in quotes, intelligent and, in quotes, true. That mirrors create human beings is just as true as that our brain produces thoughts. The contents of our consciousness persist. For our organization, it is necessary that we be able to perceive these existing contents of consciousness. To this end we must face the reflection of our consciousness in our physical body. Thus our physical body is what we may call a reflecting apparatus for the contents of our ordinary consciousness. <clears throat> these contents exist in our soul and spiritual being and we perceive them by holding up to them the mirror of our corporeality. We cannot perceive them directly in our soul, just as we cannot see ourselves without a mirror. That is how things are. Of course, our body is not just a passive reflecting apparatus, but there are all kinds of processes going on within it. So we can imagine that while a mirror is silvered on the surface to produce the reflection, Beneath the surface of our physical body, 
there are all sorts of processes going on. This comparison is sufficient to show the relationship between our spiritual and soul being and our body. What we want to keep in mind is that for everything we experience in our everyday consciousness, our physical body is an adequate reflecting apparatus. Behind, or let us say beneath, the facts of ordinary consciousness lie the things that stream into our ordinary soul life and that we designate as contents living in the hidden depths of the soul. Poets and artists experience something of what exists in the hidden depths of the soul, especially when they know as genuine poets or artists that they do not arrive at what they express in their works through ordinary thinking and logic or through sense perception. Instead these things emerge from the unknown depths where they exist without first having to be arranged by the forces of ordinary consciousness. But from these hidden depths of the soul other things also emerge, things that play a part in our everyday consciousness, although in everyday life we are unaware of their origin. As we saw yesterday, we can go down deeper into the realm of semi-consciousness, the realm of dreams, and we know that dreams can bring up things from the hidden depths of soul life that we cannot lift up in the usual way just by exerting our consciousness. When an event long buried in memory appears before a person's soul in a dream picture, as happens again and again, the individual in most cases could never have lifted the event out of the hidden pits of soul life through recollection alone, because the ordinary consciousness does not extend so far down. But what is inaccessible to this ordinary consciousness is within easy reach for the unconscious. In the semi-conscious state, characteristic of dreams, much has been stored or preserved, so to speak, is, excuse me, much that has been stored or preserved, so to speak, is brought up or allowed to rise up. However, only those things come up that have not had the kind of effect usually produced by experiences that sink down into the hidden depths of the soul. We become healthy or ill, are in a bad mood or in a good mood, not because of the ordinary course of our life, but because a bodily condition results from the experiences that have sunk down. We can no longer remember them, but they are in the depths of our soul life and make us what we become in the course of life. Many people's lives would be quite comprehensible to us if we only knew what had descended into the depths throughout their lives. If we were able to trace their lives back into childhood, we would be able to understand many people in their thirties, forties or fifties, and would know why they have this or that predisposition, why they feel so deeply dissatisfied in this or that area of life without themselves being able to pinpoint the causes. We would then be able to get an idea of how their parents and environment affected them, of the sorrow and joy, the pleasure and pain that were evoked and still work on the total mood of the person, even though the events themselves have probably been totally forgotten. For what streams out of our consciousness down into the hidden depths of the soul continues to work there. It is a curious fact that what continues to work works primarily upon ourselves and does not leave, so to speak, the sphere of our personality. Therefore, when the clairvoyant consciousness descends, and this can happen through what we call imagination or imaginative cognition, when the clairvoyant consciousness descends to the realm of the unconscious, where the things I have just described rule, then the person concerned always finds himself or herself. The seeker finds what exists and surges within him or her. And that is good, for in true self-knowledge we must get to know ourselves by observing and familiarizing ourselves with all the driving forces at work within us. If we penetrate with our clairvoyant consciousness into the unconscious, by means of the exercises for imaginative cognition, 
and do not notice that first of all we find only ourselves with all that lives and works in us, then we lay ourselves open to all kinds of errors. For nothing that can be compared to our ordinary contents of consciousness can make us aware that we are dealing only with ourselves. At one stage or another we have the possibility, let us say, to have visions, to see apparitions that are new compared to what we know from experience. This may happen, but to believe that such things are part of the higher worlds would be a serious mistake. These things do not present themselves in the same way as things in our inner life appear to the ordinary consciousness. If we have a headache, that is a fact of our ordinary consciousness. We know that the pain is located in our head. If we have a stomach ache, we feel it within ourselves. If we descend into what we call the hidden depths of the soul, we remain absolutely within ourselves, and yet what we encounter may present itself as if it were outside of us. Let us consider a striking example. <clears throat> Let us assume that someone has a longing to be the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene. I have already told you that I have counted twenty-four such Mary Magdalenes in my lifetime. Let us assume also that the person does not yet admit this wish to himself or herself. After all, we do not need to admit our own wishes to our conscious mind. That is not necessary. So, someone reads the story of Mary Magdalene in the Bible and likes it very much. The desire to be Mary Magdalene can arise at once in the unconscious mind, while in the ordinary or surface consciousness there is nothing but a liking for this character. Unbeknownst to the person, there lives a growing desire to be Mary Magdalene in the unconscious this individual goes through the world, and as long as nothing intervenes, there is this liking for Mary Magdalene in the ordinary consciousness. That is to say, as far as this person knows, he or she simply likes Mary Magdalene. The ardent desire to be Mary Magdalene lives in the unconscious, but the person knows nothing of that, and so is not troubled by it. The person's life is guided by the contents of the ordinary consciousness, and this fierce desire may never enter his or her conscious mind. But let us assume that as a result of applying some occult practice or other, this person can reach his or her unconscious and enter into it. The desire to be Mary Magdalene may not be perceived the way we become aware of a headache. In fact, if it were perceived this way, then the person could be reasonable and sensible and react to this desire as he or she would react to a headache, namely by trying to get rid of it. But because of the person's irregular penetration into the unconscious, that is not what happens. Instead, the desire presents itself as a fact outside the person and appears as the vision, You are Mary Magdalene. It stands before the individual, projecting itself as a fact. And at the current stage of evolution, human beings are not able to control such things with their eye, capital. With good, correct, and careful schooling, this cannot happen, for then the eye goes along into every sphere. But as soon as something happens without the eye going along, such visions appear as objective facts. The observer in question believes himself or herself to be recalling the events surrounding Mary Magdalene and identifies with her. This is a real possibility. <clears throat> I emphasize this possibility today so you may see that only careful schooling and caution regarding our entrance into the domain of occultism can save us from falling into error. We must keep in mind that we must first see a whole world before us and must perceive objects and events around us, but not things we relate to ourselves or that are within us, even though they appear as a world tableau. We must know that we do well at first to consider what we see only as a projection of our own inner life. Then we are well protected from errors along this way. This is the best of all. Regard, as a general rule, everything as phenomena emanating from yourself. Most of them arise out of our wishes, vanities, and aspirations, 
in short out of characteristics connected with our egoism. These things project themselves, for the most part, outward. And you may now ask, how can we avoid these errors? How can we save ourselves from them? We cannot save ourselves from these errors through the ordinary contents of consciousness. The error comes about when we cannot escape from ourselves and are all entangled in ourselves, although in reality we are facing a world tableau. From this you can see that it is crucial that in some way we get out of ourselves and learn something to distinguish, excuse me, and learn somehow to distinguish. Here is one vision and there another. The visions are both outside ourselves. One is perhaps only the projection of a desire, while the other is a fact. However, the difference between them is not as great as that between the headache someone has, someone else has, and the one you have. Our own inner life is projected out into space, and so is the inner life of other persons. How can we distinguish between them? We must learn to distinguish true from false impressions within the occult domain, even though they are mixed up and all appear with the same claim to authenticity. It is as though we looked into the physical world and saw imaginary trees in addition to real ones. We would not be able to tell the difference between them. If both real and imaginary trees were there, we would see real objective facts which are independent of us as well as those arising only from our own inner life. How can we learn to distinguish between these two intermingled realms? We do not learn this primarily through our consciousness. <laughs> if we remain entirely within the confines of our mental life, there is no possibility of differentiation. This possibility lies only in the slow, occult training of the soul. As we advance further and further, we learn to distinguish, that is, to do in the sphere of the occult what we would have to do if we saw real and imaginary trees next to each other on the physical plane. We can walk through the imaginary trees, but we meet real resistance if we try to do that with real trees. <clears throat> Something similar, although of course only as a spiritual fact, must confront us in the realm of the occult. If we go about it in the right way, we can learn in a fairly simple way to distinguish between the true and false in this realm, not through ideas, but through a decision of our will. This resolution may be brought about in the following way. If we look back at our life, we find two clearly different groups of events. We often find that this or that success or failure is related to our abilities. We can understand that if we do not succeed very well in a certain field because we are not particularly bright in this area, excuse me, read that again. we can understand that we do not succeed very well in a certain field because we are not particularly bright in this area. On the other hand, in areas where we assume we have some ability, we find our success quite naturally. Perhaps we need not always see so clearly the connection between what we do and our abilities. There is also a less definite way to realize this connection. For example, if someone in the later years of life is pursued by this or that misfortune, then that person can think back and say, quote, I did little to make myself strong and energetic, close quote, or quote, I was always careless and irresponsible, close quote. On the other hand, the person may also say, quote, well, I do not fully understand the connection between my lack of success and the things I did, but I do see that things cannot always turn out as well for a careless, lazy person as they do for a conscientious and industrious one." Close quote. In short, we can understand some of our successes and failures, but for others we cannot discover their connection to our abilities. Then we feel that although we have this or that ability, and therefore should have su been successful in this or that undertaking, it nevertheless did not succeed. Thus there is clearly a type of success or failure whose connection with our abilities we cannot see right away. There are also certain things 
that meet us as blows of fate in the outside world, and regarding these we can sometimes say that they do, after all, appear fair and just, for we have actually furnished all the preconditions for these things. However, some other things happen that we cannot explain. Thus there are two types of experiences, those due to us, whose connection to our abilities we realize, and those that are inexplicable. Our external experiences fall likewise into two classes, those of which we cannot say we have produced their preconditions, and others where we know we have brought about the conditions that allowed them to happen. Now let us look around a little at our lives. Here is a useful experiment for everyone. We could gather together all the things we cannot see the causes of, that is, successes that led us to say, quote, even a fool can be right sometimes, close quote. In short, successes we cannot attribute to ourselves. We can do the same for failures and to those seemingly accidental outer events for which we know of no motivating influence. And now we can make the following experiment. We construct in our mind an artificial human being, so to speak, who through his own abilities brought about all those of our successes we cannot explain. If we succeeded in something that required wisdom in an area where we are stupid, then we imagine a person who is particularly clever in this field and who simply had to succeed. Or, in the case of an outer event, we proceed in this way. Let us say a brick falls on our head. We can see no reason for this, but we imagine someone who brought it about by running up to the roof and loosening the brick, so that it could only be a short time before it must fall down. Then this person runs down quickly and the brick hits him. We can do this with events that we know, with our ordinary consciousness, we have not brought about, events that sometimes happen very much against our will. Let us assume that at some time in our life someone had hit us. To make this less difficult, let us place this event back in our childhood. Let us imagine we had somehow employed somebody to spank us, that we had indeed done everything possible to get this spanking. In short, we imagine a human being who takes upon himself everything we cannot account for. You see, if we want to progress in occultism, we must do many things that run contrary to the ordinary course of events. If you do only what generally seems reasonable, you will not get far in occultism, for things relating to higher worlds may at first seem quite foolish. Thus it does not matter that our method here seems foolish to the prosaic people in the outer world. Well, we construct this human being in our mind. At first, it seems to us merely grotesque that we do this, perhaps even without understanding the reason for it. However, everyone who tries this will make a strange discovery, namely the astonishing discovery that he or she no longer wants to get rid of this being, but rather begins to find it interesting. If you try it, you will see for yourself. You cannot get away from this artificial human being. It lives within you. And, strangely enough, it not only lives within us, but it also transforms itself radically to such an extent that at last it becomes something completely different than it had been. It turns into something we must admit indeed exists within us. This is an experience everyone can have. We can realize that what I have just described, not the original human being we created in our fantasy, but what has become of it, is part of what is within us. Now this is just what has, so to speak, brought about the things in our life that have apparently no causes. Thus we find within ourselves the real cause of what otherwise cannot be explained. In other words, what I have described to you is not only the way to look into your own soul life and find something, but also the way from the soul life into the environment. For our failures do not remain with us, 
but belong to our environment. Thus we have taken something out of our environment that does not agree with the facts of our consciousness, but presents itself as if it were within us. Then we get the feeling that we really have something to do with events that seem to have no cause in real life. In this way we get a sense for our connection with our destiny, with what is called karma. This soul experiment opens for us a way to experience karma within ourselves. You may say that you do not fully understand what I have said, but if you say that it is not because you do not understand what you think you cannot understand, rather you do not comprehend something even a child can grasp, simply because you have not thought of it. It is impossible for anyone who has not carried out the experiment to understand these things. Only those who have done this experiment can understand. What I have said is nothing else than the description of an experiment everyone can make and experience. Everyone can come to the realization that something lives within us that is connected with our karma. If people knew this from the outset, we would not need to give them a method for attaining this knowledge. It is quite all right that people who have not made the experiment do not un comprehend what I said. However, it is not a question of understanding information about something our soul can do. When our soul follows such paths, it becomes used not only to living within itself, in its own wishes and desires, but to seeing its relationship to outer events and to considering them. That is what our soul gets used to through this experiment. It is precisely the things we have not wished for that we have built into what we have spoken about. Then we can face our destiny in such a way that we can calmly take it upon us. And when we can say about those things we usually grumble and rebel against, quote, we accept them willingly, for we ourselves have imposed them on us. Close quote. Then a state of mind and heart develops that allows us to distinguish with absolute certainty between what is true and false on our way down into the hidden depths of the soul. Then it will be wonderfully clear and obvious what is true and what is false. If you see a vision with your inner eye and can drive it away, banish it, as it were, by a mere look, simply through using all the forces you feel within you and have come to know, then it is just a phantom. But if you cannot get rid of it in this way, if you can banish at most what reminds you of the outer world, while the really visionary part, the spiritual, still remains like a solid fact, then it is a true vision. But you cannot make this distinction until you have done what I have described. Therefore, without the above-mentioned schooling, there can be no certainty in distinguishing between the true and the false on the supersensible plane. The essential thing in this soul experiment is that we always remain in full possession of our ordinary consciousness in everything we desire. Through this experiment we get used to considering what we do not at all want in our ordinary consciousness, what is repugnant to us as something we have willed into existence. We may have advanced to a certain degree of inner development, but we will make one mistake after another unless through such an experiment we counterbalance the wishes, desires, sympathies and antipathies in our soul with our connection to what we did not want. The greatest mistake in the Theosophical Society was made by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky when she fixed her spiritual attention upon the realm where Christ may be found, while in her wishes and desires, in short, in her ordinary consciousness, she had a lasting antipathy, even a passionate loathing for everything Christian or Hebrew, and a preference for all other spiritual cultures on earth. And because she had never gone through what has been described today, her notion of the Christ naturally was completely wrong. She passed it on to her closest students, 
and since then it has been dragged along, oversimplifi oversimplified to the point of grotesqueness, even er, into the present day. These things extend to the highest spheres. Seeing many things on the occult plane is different from being able to distinguish between them. This must be strongly emphasized. When we immerse ourselves into our hidden soul depths, and every clairvoyant must do this, we first come into what is fundamentally ourselves. And we must get to know ourselves by really making the transition that begins with looking at a world whose kingdoms Lucifer and Araman always promise to give us. This means our own inner self is put before us, and the devil says it is the objective world. That is the temptation even Christ did not escape. The illusions of his own inner world were presented, but through his inherent power. He recognized from the very beginning that this is not a real world, but a world that is within. It is from this inner world alone, which we must separate into two parts, one of which, namely our own personal part, we can get rid of while the other remains, that we pass through the hidden depths of our soul life out into the objective, supersensible world. Just as our spiritual soul core must make use of our physical body as a mirror to perceive the outer world and the contents of ordinary consciousness, so it must make use of our etheric body as a reflecting apparatus to perceive the supersensible facts confronting us. The higher sense organs, if we may call them that, appear within the astral body, but what lives in them must be reflected by the etheric body, just as the spiritual and soul activity we are aware of in our everyday life is reflected by the physical body. We must now learn to manage our etheric body. We are usually not aware of our etheric body, although it vitalizes us. Naturally, then, we must first get to know it before we can become able to recognize what enters into us from the supersensible world outside us and is reflected by our etheric body. What we experience when we descend into the hidden depths of our soul life and experience first of all ourselves, that is the projection of our wishes, resembles the life in Kamaloka. The only difference is that when we advance in our ordinary life to this state of being imprisoned in ourselves, for that is what we must call it, we can still return to our physical body. But in Kamaloka the physical body is gone, and so is part of the etheric body that primarily reflects us. Instead, the universal life ether surrounding us serves as an instrument of reflection and mirrors everything within us. Thus, when we are in Kamaloka, our own inner world, all our wishes and desires, our feelings and moods, is built up as an objective world around us. It is important to understand that the primary characteristic of our life in Kamaloka is our imprisonment within ourselves, and this prison is the more securely bolted because we cannot return to the physical life our whole inner activity was geared to. Only when we live through our Kamaluka period in such a way that we gradually realize, and the realization does come only gradually, that we can get rid of everything around us if we experience ourselves other than through mere desires and so forth. Only then does our Kamaloka prison burst open. What does this mean? Let us suppose that someone dies with a certain wish. This wish is part of what projects itself outward and is built up around him in some kind of form. As long as this wish lives within this person, he cannot open Kamaloka with any key in regard to it. But when he realizes that this wish can be satisfied only when it is discarded, when it is given up and is no longer wished, that is, when it is torn out of his soul and his attitude toward it becomes the opposite of what it had been, then 
gradually everything that imprisons him in Kamaloka will be torn from the soul together with the wish. Only then do we come into the realm between death and a new birth that has been called the Devakonic realm, which we can also enter through clairvoyance when we have recognized what belongs only to ourself. In clairvoyance we reach this point at a certain stage of maturity in our development. In Kamaloka it comes simply as a result of the passage of time, simply because time so torments us through our own desires that at last they are overcome. Then what we were led to believe was the world and its splendor is destroyed. The world of supersensible realities is usually called Devakan. How does this world of supersensible facts meet us? Here on our earth we can speak of Devakan only because in clairvoyance, when the self has really been overcome, we enter the world of supersensible facts, which objectively exist and coincide with what is present in Devakan. The most important characteristic of the Devakanic world is that moral and physical facts and laws can no longer be distinguished. Moral and physical laws have become one and the same. What does this what does that mean? Well, is it not true that in the physical world the sun shines upon the just and the unjust? Those who commit a crime may be put in prison, but the physical sun is not darkened. That is to say, in the physical world there is a realm of moral and one of physical laws, and both go their separate ways. It is not so in Devakan, not at all. Instead, there, everything proceeding from morality, from intelligent wisdom, from the aesthetically beautiful, and so on, leads to creation, while everything that arises from immorality, intellectual untruths, and ugliness leads to deterioration and destruction. There the laws of nature are such that the sun does not shine upon the just and the unjust alike, but if we may speak figuratively, it darkens before the unjust. The just people passing through Devakan have there the spiritual sunshine, that is to say the influence of the fructifying forces that help them in life. However, these spiritual forces draw back from the dishonest or nasty person, there things are possible that are impossible here on earth. For example, when two people, one who is just and one unjust, walk here side by side, the sun cannot shine on one without also shining on the other. However, in the spiritual world, the effect of the spiritual forces on people depends absolutely on the quality of the individual concerned. That is to say, the laws of nature and the spiritual laws do not go their separate ways, but follow one and the same path. That is the fundamental truth. In the Devakonic world, the natural laws and the moral and intellectual ones work together as one. As a result, the following occurs. When we enter the Devakonic world and live there, we have within us all the justice and injustice, good and evil, beauty and ugliness, truth and falsehood, from our last life. All this acts there in such a way that it takes immediate possession of the natural laws. For example, in terms of the physical world, we would describe the law there as follows. If someone in the physical world had stolen or lied, and then went out into the sun, that person would find that the sun no longer shone on him, and gradually this lack of sunshine would make him ill. Or let us imagine that someone in the physical world told a lie and then had difficulty breathing. That is an analogy to what would be the case in the Devakonic world. To the person who had burdened his conscience with this or that, something happens in his spiritual and soul nature, so that the natural law, at the same time and absolutely, expresses the spiritual law. Therefore, as this person continues to live and develop further through the Devakonic world, gradually more and more properties will permeate him that will make what he then becomes an expression of the qualities he brought with him from the previous life. Let us suppose that someone lives in Devakon for two hundred years after having lied much in a previous life. 
This person indeed lives in Devakan, but the spirits of truth withdraw from him. There dies in him what in a truthful soul would come to life. Or let us assume that someone with a pronounced trait of vanity, which he has not given up, goes through Devakan. In Devakan this vanity is an extraordinarily evil-smelling emanation, and certain spiritual beings avoid a personality who gives out the offensive smell of ambition or vanity. This is not a figurative statement. In Devakan vanity and ambition are extremely malodorous and lead certain beings to withdraw, and therefore their beneficent influence is lost. This is like expecting a plant to grow in the cellar, although it requires sunlight to thrive. A vain person cannot thrive. He will grow up under the influence of this characteristic. When he reincarnates, he lacks the strength to build in the good. Let me read that again. When he reincarnates, he lacks the strength to build in the good influences. Therefore, Instead of developing certain organs in a healthy way, he forms an unhealthy organ system in his body. Thus what we will become can be seen not only from our physical conditions, but also from our moral and intellectual ones. Only when we emerge from the spiritual plane do natural and spiritual laws go their separate parallel ways. However, between death and a new birth they form a unity. And the natural forces implanted in our soul are destructive if they are the result of immoral deeds and past lives, but fruitful if they are the result of noble actions. This is true not only for our inner constitution, but also for what meets us from outside as our karma. In Devakan, the essential fact is that no difference exists between natural and spiritual laws and it is the same for the clairvoyant who really penetrates to the supersensible worlds. The supersensible worlds are radically different from what we have on the physical plane. It is simply impossible for the clairvoyant to make the distinction the materialist outlook makes in saying that something is only an objective law of nature. Behind this objective natural law stands always a spiritual law. A clairvoyant cannot cross a parched meadow, for example, or a flooded district, cannot see the eruption of a volcano, without thinking that behind the facts of nature there are spiritual forces, spiritual beings. For the clairvoyant the eruption of a volcano is at the same time also a moral deed, even though its morality may lie in an entirely different, undreamt-of realm. People who always confuse the physical with the higher worlds will say, quote, Well, when innocent human beings are destroyed in the eruption of a volcano, one cannot assume that it is a moral deed. Close quote. Such a judgment would be as cruelly philistine as the opposite one, namely to regard the eruption as a punishment from God for the people living near the volcano. Both judgments are possible only from the narrow-minded standpoint of the physical world. However, that is not the question. But much more universal things may be at stake here. Those who live on the slope of a volcano and whose property is destroyed by its eruption may in fact be entirely innocent as far as this life is concerned. It will be made up to them later. This does not mean that we should be hard-hearted and not help them. That would again be a narrow-minded interpretation of the facts. Nevertheless, it is true that in the case of volcanic eruptions there is the fact that human beings do certain things in the course of earth evolution that retard human evolution. And the good gods must work to compensate for that. And so indeed such natural phenomena sometimes are necessary to create a counterbalance. <laughs> the connections between such things can sometimes be seen only in occult depths. In this way, things human beings have done counter to the true spiritual course of the development can find compensation. Every event, even if it seems to be a mere phenomenon of nature, is at bottom a moral matter. And spiritual beings in the higher worlds are the bearers of the moral law behind the physical facts. 
If you imagine a world where there is no separation of natural and spiritual laws, in other words, a world where justice rules as a natural law, then you have the devakonic world. Therefore, in this devakonic world, crimes are not punished through some kind of arbitrary measures. Rather, the immoral destroys itself as inexorably as fire consumes combustible substances. By the same token, morality advances on its own. <clears throat> we thus see that the essential characteristic, the innermost heart, so to speak, of existence, is quite different in the different worlds. We cannot get an idea of these different worlds if we do not consider these radically different peculiarities. Thus we can now correctly characterize the physical world, Kama Loka, and Devakan as follows. In the physical world, natural and spiritual laws run side by side as two series of facts. In Kamaloka, human beings are confined within themselves as if in the prison of their own being. The Devakonic world is the complete opposite of the physical. There, natural and spiritual law are one and the same. These are the three characteristics. And if you consider them carefully and try to get a feeling for how very different from our own a world must be where the moral, intellectual, and even the law of beauty are at the same time natural laws, then you will get a sense of what the Devakonic world is like. When we meet an ugly or a beautiful person in our physical world, we have no right to treat the ugly person as if he were to be rejected in soul-spiritual terms, or the beautiful one as if he were necessarily in soul-spiritual terms worthy of high esteem. In Devakon it is quite different. There we meet no ugliness that is not deserved. At the same time, a person who has an ugly face in this incarnation, because of his deeds in the previous one, and who strove throughout this life to be true and honest, will surely not meet us in Devakon in an ugly form. Rather, he will certainly have transformed his ugliness into beauty. But it is equally true that people who are dishonest, vain, or ambitious in this life will wander about in Devakon in an ugly shape. And something else is also true. In ordinary physical life, we do not see that an ugly face continually robs itself of something, while a beautiful face gives something to itself. However, in Devakon, ugliness is an element of continuous destruction. While we, while we will not see anything beautiful without assuming that it is the result of an equally continuance, continuous furtherance and stimulation. Thus we must feel quite differently toward the devakonic or mental world than toward the physical world. And it is necessary that you differentiate between these sensations and see what is essential and crucial so that you learn not only the outer description of these things, but also absorb feelings and impressions toward the things spiritual science describes. If you try to advance to an appreciation of a world where morality, beauty, and intellectual truth appear as inexorable as natural law, then you have a sense of the devakonic world. This is why we must, so to speak, collect so much material and work so much so that we can ultimately forge what we have gained into one feeling. It is impossible for anyone to come easily to a real knowledge of what must gradually be presented to the world through spiritual science. There are many different movements that say, quote, Oh, why must we learn so many things in spiritual science? Are we to become pupils again? After all, feeling is all that matters. Close quote. It does indeed matter but it must be the right feeling, which must first be developed. This is true of everything. It would be nice, would it not, for the painter if he did not have to learn the technique of his art, if he did not have to paint the picture slowly on the canvas, if he needed only to blow on his hands to have his finished work before him. It is a strange thing in our world that the more people approach the realm of the soul, the harder it is for them to realize that merely blowing on one's hands is not enough. Nobody will accept that anyone can be a composer without first learning about music. There it is quite obvious. People are almost, though not quite, 
as willing to admit that the same is true for painting. For poetry they admitted even less, otherwise there would be fewer poets in our time. For actually no time is as unpoetic as our own, though there are so many poets. People think it is not necessary to have studied poetry. One only needs to be able to write, which naturally has nothing to do with poetry, and of course to spell correctly and to express one's thoughts properly. And for philosophy, still less seems required. Today it is taken for granted that anyone can easily judge anything concerning world views and philosophies of life, since everyone has his or her own standpoint. Thus, we find again and again that it does not count for much when someone has painstakingly used various means and methods of inner work to research and to know something in the world. Instead, it is accepted as a matter of course that the standpoint of those who have labored long before venturing to say a little about world secrets is given the same value as that of people who simply have decided that they too will have a standpoint. These days everyone is a person with a world view. And being a theosophist, according to the opinion of some, is still easier. It does not require more than accepting in one's own individual fashion only the first of the three basic principles of the Theosophical Society, rather than all of them. This first principle really asks nothing more than that one should with more or less sincerity admit to be a loving person. It doesn't matter, matter whether one really is loving or not, and so one is simply a theosophist and then has the right feeling. Thus, when we consider the requirements for passing judgments and evaluating standpoints, we see a continuous decline from music through matters that require less and less until we end with theosophy. For there it is enough, and this would not suffice in painting, that one just blows on one's hands. We form the core of the brotherhood of all human beings. That makes us theosophists. We do not need to learn anything. However, what really matters is that we work with all our energy so that we can finally gather what we have thus acquired and carry it over into feelings, which will color it and thus make it the highest, the truest knowledge. Struggle through and work your way to such a feeling that belongs to the impression of a world where natural and spiritual law coincide. Then, if you work seriously, no matter how much you exerted yourself in working through this or that theory, it will make an impression on the devaconic world. If you have not simply imagined a feeling, but developed it through years of careful work, then this feeling, these nuances of sensitivity, have a strength that will carry you further than they could reach of themselves. But then they have become true through serious and conscientious study. Then you are not far from the point where these nuances burst open, and there lies before you the reality of Devakan. For if the nuances of feeling are truly acquired through work, they become a capacity for perception. Therefore, if we really and truly work in our branch groups, not for sensations, but based on honesty and patient practice, then our meeting places will become what they should be, namely schools to lead people into the realms of clairvoyance. And only those who cannot wait for this or who do not want to join us in working can maintain a wrong view of these matters.